District of Conservation is sponsored by the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, better known as CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thanks for listening to the program. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use, but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. Since I've been traveling back to back for the last few weeks, I haven't given my full attention to this story I'm going to discuss today, but I need to because I posted about it on social media more. I glanced over this and a Los Angeles Times editorial on the catalyzation of Western lands, 11 states, 22 million acres, that essentially said 22 million acres of public lands will have to be raised through and destroyed because climate change is far worse than potential destruction of land from utility scale solar. That is why I'm going to briefly talk in hopefully 20 minutes or less about this updated Western solar plan from the Biden administration, Department of Interior, BLM, and what the problems are with utility scale solar. I have railed against renewables, especially these large scale projects consistently on the podcast. I think only hypothetically they could exist in really small amounts, but the more and more that I see these like catalyzation plans for utility scale solar or utility scale wind, I am vehemently against these proposals because I know that they're backed by government subsidies and billions of dollars in federal spending, our taxpayer dollars. And even that injection of federal spending does not create a market demand for this type of electricity generation whatsoever. This is a problem. This is a habitual pattern we're seeing with all of the scaling up of first wind and now solar. What is this update to the Western solar plan? I'm going to read for you the press release from January 17th and the headline from Department of Interior's Biden-Harris administration announces significant progress to catalyze solar energy development throughout the West. Updated roadmap for solar development will help meet Biden's goals for net zero electric grid by 2035. Again, with these silly arbitrary deadlines that will never be met, but offer lofty promises. The Biden Harris administration has permitted enough clean energy to power more than 3.5 million homes. That's never going to be achieved. So there's going to be a draft environmental impact statement about this updated solar plan in the grand scheme of things. They claim that this is going to be part of Biden's investing in America agenda to accelerate the clean energy and transmission build out to lower consumers energy costs. I've yet to see proof of this. There's a lot of high upfront costs and across the lifetime of these energy sources, these projects, you're going to pay more for energy overall. I'm seeing this everywhere and I'm so sorry to sound pessimistic and insert this as I'm reading this, but this needs to be known. I have to debunk this as I'm reading it to you. I was also looking to see exactly how much they want to generate in electricity with solar energy. I can't find the amount of gigawatts that they want to use. It's not readily available. Like I know for offshore wind, they want 30 gigawatts of electricity produced by wind energy, offshore wind energy by 2030. Since Orsted and other companies have pulled out on projects and they've canceled projects, that will never be met. But there's no number about solar, meaning it's unobtainable. Maybe they don't want people to know the lack of electricity that will be produced here. But I had to scan through down. So it says an updated roadmap for solar energy development on public lands. On, again, January 17th, the department, DOI, published a draft analysis of the utility scale solar energy programmatic environmental impact statement. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Known as the updated Western Solar Plan, which would streamline the BLM's framework for citing solar energy projects in order to support current and future national clean energy goals, long-term energy security, Baloney. 
climate resilience and improved conservation outcomes. Boy, oh boy, are we going to debate those conservation outcomes. And I have two unlikely sources that are actually calling this plan into question, which I'll read for you as I comb through this a bit more. So the proposal is an update of BLM's 2012 Western Solar Plan. And they've identified areas in Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Wyoming, and again, in totality, 11 states with high solar potential and low resource conflicts in order to guide responsible solar development and provide certainty to developers. Following months of stakeholder engagements, including 15 public scoping meetings, the updated roadmap refines the analysis in the original six states and expands it to include Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, Wyoming. So you have Arizona where they're looking to do this, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. In considering updates to the Western Solar Plan, the BLM worked closely with Department of Energy's National Renewable energy laboratory to examine forecasts for clean energy needs and determine that approximately 700,000 acres of public lands would be needed to meet these goals. The BLM's preferred alternative in the updated Western solar plan would provide approximately 22 million acres of open land for solar application, giving maximum flexibility to reach the nation's clean energy goals. You heard me correctly. 22 million acres in terms of their preferred updated Western solar plan. I read that there are five plans, but of their preferred plan, just to cut through the noise about this, this is what you need to focus your efforts on and pay attention to. By directing development to areas that have fewer sensitive resources, less conflict with other uses of public lands, and close proximity transmission lines, the BLM can permit clean energy more efficiently while maintaining robust public and tribal engagement, which are central features of all BLM reviews of individual projects. I can tell you for a fact, with most recent project assessments, stakeholder engagement, people on the ground, you guys have heard me talk about and report on Lava Ridge Wind Project. Nobody there wants that project whatsoever. The tribes don't want it. The Japanese American Historic Landmark Site Advocates don't want it. The farmers don't want it. The conservationists don't want it. So again, I need to debunk this because they're saying they're having stakeholder engagement. I've yet to see this because you have the administration going to these areas with predetermined conclusions, basically saying we're proceeding with this. We may meet with people who disagree. They don't allow for comment. They don't allow for public meetings. I I keep hearing this from people I know on the ground all across the country where these projects are coming and where these solar and wind companies are preying on people who don't want this in their backyard. And also there's also so many of them who are rejecting these projects writ large as well. So there is no stakeholder engagement except those who prefer to streamline this without any assurances, without any accountability, because they have to hastily transition by 2035, 2050, 2040, whatever the hell arbitrary deadline it is. So, okay. One more thing before I get in some interesting criticism of the plan from some unlikely sources. BLM utilized $4.3 million from the Inflation Reduction Act. That is what's giving a boost to these renewable projects that no one wants, that there's no market demand for, remember, to invest in these important updates to the Western Solar Plan. This investment is helping improve the solar development application process by providing developers with better predictability while also maintaining sufficient flexibility to address site-specific resource considerations. This planning work also seeks to provide updates to that respond to changes like advances in technology that have occurred since the BLM's last programmatic solar development planning effort over a decade ago. The analysis announced today on then January 17th evaluates six alternatives, each proposing to make different amounts of public land available to solar development applications under different criteria, such as proximity tra- to transmission infrastructure, designated critical habitat, or other ecological and cultural resources. That's a mouthful to absorb. So let me read for you two interesting pieces of criticism. One from a group I was not expecting whatsoever. Backcountry hunters and anglers, they came out swinging against this. BHA opposes solar development in priority habitat, migration corridors, and popular public land hunting grounds. This is a group that is known to take more kind of lefty stances. I've heard they have some new management, so maybe they're going to tone down a little bit. But they have been in support of early Biden administration proposals, and there's a lot of criticism about the group. But I will say that in this statement, I was very particularly 
interested in what they had to say. While acknowledging the multiple use mandate of BLM and Energy Act of 2020, which instructs the Secretary of Interior to seek to issue permits for solar wind geothermal projects on public lands, BHA will submit comments and continue to demand highly scrutinized permitting process that excludes priority landscapes with critical habitat for fish and wildlife, ungulate migration routes, lands purchased through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, wild and scenic river corridor, sage grouse core areas, areas of critical environmental concern, lands and wilderness characteristics, and many additional categories. While BHA recognizes multiple use laws that govern our public lands, we seek to ensure that any public land development proposals take into consideration the value of fish and wildlife habitat migration corridors and potential impacts to hunting and fishing to ensure responsible siting of projects, whether renewable or not. So that's an interesting rebuke of the plan. I want to read for you a similar criticism or rather a report criticizing this plan from Meat Eater. This Meat Eater writer says to the effect that this plan is vague regarding impacts on wildlife. The magnitude of impacts depends on the wildlife that occupy the area prior to construction and the timing of construction activities relative to the crucial life stages of wildlife, the plan states, according to the report. To determine what specific lands are eligible for exclusion, the plan advises that projects must be in line with more localized BLM resource management plans. And then they go on to say that these local management plans tend to be relatively vague when addressing wildlife concerns. A lot of these renewable projects don't care about wildlife. Same with Antiquities Act abuses and misconstruing of national monuments. They don't account for wildlife management decisions. I hope these people understand that now with this. Okay, let's read back more, but I had to insert that because a lot of these decisions, these wide sweeping decisions do not account for wildlife management decisions and wildlife in general. So they also say of the 22 million total acres of their most preferred draft environmental impact statement, 22 million total acres identified. BLM predicts that about 3% or about 700,000 acres of that will be needed to meet the Biden administration clean energy goals. Scanning down a little more, the author goes on to talk about the footprint of solar. I don't know if he knows that utility scale solar has a very big footprint, but among renewable energy options, solar has a small visual footprint on the landscape, much smaller than wind turbines since they can't be seen from a distance and doesn't require huge infrastructure like hydro dams. Hydro dams are good. And I'm going to be exploring that topic for Conservation Nation more this year. So you'll see that from me. It's a step, this author continues, towards moving away from fossil fuels that, broadly speaking, many hunters and conservationists support. I don't know Anyone in my orbit, anecdotally speaking, and I've yet to see surveys confirm this back to back, like multiple surveys or reports show this, that hunters and anglers are for net zero goals. There are hunters and anglers who support fighting climate change, whatever. Great. I think caring about your surroundings is extremely important, but it's debatable, you know, whether or not climate change is catastrophic. We are having this debate in the outdoor industry, and a lot of people disagree with that assertion. But I don't think every sportsman or sportswoman has signed on and pledged to go carbon neutral by some arbitrary deadline. I'm clicking on the hyperlink from this Meat meat Eater article about nature-based climate solutions. And as you scan through this, I don't think anyone is opposed to nature-based climate solutions. It's what you do to empower the free market. You're more conscious. You find things that are, you know, stewardship-minded, what have you. But I'm looking through here. And it doesn't say anything about a percentage of sportsmen and women who support going carbon free, going net zero (laughs) there. Again, there's, I haven't seen any, anything whatsoever. And you scan through this article and, and yet you don't see it. Okay. So many doesn't mean everyone nor a majority. So I disagree with the assertion, this claim that every sportsman, every sportswoman supports net zero. There's no substantiation of that. So these writers have to be extremely careful to speak in totality for all sportsmen and women, because I don't agree with net zero. Most of the people I know who hunt and fish and also work in energy don't agree with net zero. But I found both criticism from BHA and this Meat Eater article to be interesting. They don't fully understand the totality, I would say, especially the latter of solar utility scale solar the size of Indiana, as my friend Ryan Maui, a climatologist who used to work in NOAA in the last administrations, as he pointed out, the size of Indiana. Can you believe that? And then some other plans I've seen about utility scale solar, it would be the size of Virginia, my adopted state. 
So let's talk about briefly as we round out this discussion about this Western solar plan. What does utility scale solar look like? What is its impact? Because if 22 million acres went to an oil, gas, or coal operation on federal lands, but they're strategically and slowly trying to remove these projects. They've been working across this from both the Biden administration to back to the Obama era when they were discouraging coal leasing. Now they're doing it for oil and gas leasing. So they're pushing this BLM to go to a multiple use philosophy where only solar and wind, which are unreliable, intermittent, have a questionable footprint, carbon, environmental, otherwise financial too, because this is again, not financed <laughs> by private means for the most part. This is government spending. Through- what is the environmental impact of utility scale solar projects? They may have more environmental impact as they require large land areas, which may affect the natural habitat, biodiversity, and landscape and cause water consumption, waste generation, and visual or noise pollution. That's from one source I'm reading. What does the Department of Energy even say about utility scale solar? I'm reading from the Solar Energy Development Programmatic EIS. I believe this is maybe a precursor to the Western plan or an adjacent one. And this is from 2012. Here's what they say, this DOE adjacent website about environmental concerns with solar energy development. Utility scale solar energy environmental considerations include land disturbance, land use impacts, potential impacts to specially designated areas, impacts to soil, water and air resources, impacts to vegetation, wildlife, wildlife habitat, and sensitive species, visual, cultural, paleontological, socioeconomic, and environmental justice concerns, impacts, and potential impacts from hazardous materials. Nobody talks about the end of life cycle, what happens when you... But oddly enough, Harvard does in a 2021 article about the dark side of solar power. As interest in clean energy surges, used solar panels are going straight into the landfill. The tagline says, there's a catch. The replacement rate of solar panels is faster than expected. And given the very high recycling costs, along with wind turbines, which are hard to recycle as well. Oh, and let's not forget... Where are these solar panels, solar parts being sourced from? Who is refining, producing, processing all of this? China and their partners in the third world, which rely on child labor. They have poor environmental track records and the U.S. can't compete in this market because of the monopoly they hold. So they're having to incentivize people, so to speak, incentivize with government spending Cutting reliance on China when they have cornered the market and any time we shut down critical infrastructure projects relating to energy here, the LNG exports most recently, this gives China a win to dominate here and dominate even in coal, oil, and natural gas. And get this, if you guys have followed the Bureau of Land Management, Conservation, Landscape, and Health Rule, which is due to be finalized very soon, I think this quarter, they say with the conservation lease proposal that clean energy companies can bid on a conservation lease under this conservation lease model using carbon offsets in a sense that if they develop on a conservation lease, they can offset destruction of high quality habitat with promising to offset the damage and restore rebalance nearby lower quality habitat. So you're going to give these clean energy companies, including solar, if we're talking 22 million acres, potentially, if this plan were to be approved, how much of destruction is going to take place of those aforementioned critical areas, wildlife corridors, high value land. So they can have carte blanche freedom to destroy public lands, multiple use lands in this manner, because they can promise to offset their bad behavior by Promising to restore, if we hold them to it, we can't hold them to this. They plan to restore nearby lower quality hub. It's so hypocritical. And I don't know why more environmentalists are not upset over this. This is preposterous. This is, this is disgusting. I'm sorry. This, this is unacceptable that this is being tolerated. And that is why earlier I called out the LA Times columnist who said, well, we have to fight climate change. So 22 million acres of public lands, screw it. We have to fight climate change. That takes more precedence over land use and conservation. Preservationists are very unserious people. And I know I'm getting really charged about this. I'm usually calm and level-headed. But the hypocrisies with land use 
and still requiring to use fossil fuels and how much land will be destroyed in this. Like this is infuriating. I definitely have to submit comments opposing this. This is unacceptable. I will link to the show notes of the draft environmental impact statement and you too can also weigh in. You don't need to be someone special. You don't need to be a policy analyst. You could be a regular citizen. This is what these comment periods are for. Just write a sentence as simple as that. Expressing your dismay over this proposal, especially this one of six plans that would destroy 22 million acres across 11 lands to construct energy projects that don't work and that require the sun to be powered. If these environmentalists would be serious about I don't know, reducing their carbon footprint, looking for technologically advanced solutions, you would go with nuclear. But we still have a hesitance to do nuclear in this country, even though it is becoming a more bipartisan proposal. Nuclear is what you will seriously pursue if you are certain and want to pursue a carbon neutral future. But we're not there yet. And I don't think we should be there because we have a great system in place. Fossil fuels work great. It would be horrible for us to bite the hand that feeds us. Why would we want to be impoverished? Why would we want to have a lower quality of life under this false notion of carbon neutrality, which will again, never be achieved. I'm sorry to rain your parade decarbonists, but it's never going to happen. And you're never going to lead a carbon free lifestyle. I challenge you to do it. I want to see these people live a carbon free lifestyle. Even the so-called sportsmen who believe in this, you'll never be able to live a carbon free lifestyle. Everything that I've mentioned is in the show notes. This is not invented out of thin air. I'm reading from the sources directly, and you can assess this for yourself. But again, as I said earlier, small solar projects, I have no problem. Do this privately. Don't use taxpayer money. But these utility-scale solar projects on public lands, a total disaster. This needs to be vehemently opposed. And I will do my part to oppose this. I hope you do your part as well. I'm from the West. I don't want to see the West destroyed like this. Westerners back out there should not let the government gamble with green energy like this. Make your stances heard. Please weigh comments before this closes. They may close the period before 30 days, before 60 days, but you hopefully will pay close attention. You'll get your comments in. Good luck. And let me know if you have any questions. Maybe you think I'm totally wrongheaded here, but I think I'm seeing some sort of consensus building with people who don't agree with me politically, groups that may differ in terms of our energy outlook, who are even saying, whoa, this is not a good plan. This needs to be reassessed. Let's hope cooler heads prevail and perhaps maybe enough outrage from lots of people will force them to rescind consideration of this EIS. We've seen them rescind the natural asset company proposal. The New York Stock Exchange pulled that back after so much blowback to it. Let's see the same response here. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. If you enjoyed what you heard today, go leave us some reviews on Apple and Spotify or wherever podcasts are played. Your feedback will help us reach more people. And I love to know what is on your mind after each episode. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to never miss a beat or a guest announcement because that is our way of updating all of you listeners. And we have just hit a thousand followers on Instagram for the podcast account. Thank you very much. And if you have any guest suggestions or topics you want to hear on the show, I'm all ears. I would love to hear your feedback there. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode.